there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk and, and Alice and I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we start the next part of our study as we continue on looking at what effective prayer is based on the teaching of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount yes. which is the definition of true Christianity. Amen. 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 We talked last week, we were talking about, we're, we're working our way through the prayer that is commonly known as the Our Father. Mm -hmm. The prayer that was given as a model for the disciples of Jesus Christ. And last week we were talking about, hallowed be thy name, yes. thy will be done, right? Mm -hmm. And this week we're going to start by looking at the next expression in that model, which is give us this day our daily bread. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Alice to ask God's blessing on our time together. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We come before you with humble hearts, asking you to guide and direct us, Lord. Let your word come forth and let it touch hearts and lives. Yes, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for what you've done for us. And Lord, we love you. Yes. And we just... Praise you and thank you for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I do want to remind you, I want to remind you a couple of things. I'll take care of a little business here first. The first thing is, make notes. Take yes, notes. Notes are good. All right, so you can, you can review what we've talked about, think about it, pray about it, have conversations with the Lord, and check what I say. Amen. I say this all the time. Don't take my word for anything. Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. That's what the Word of God yes. says. All right? Be a Berean. Yeah, like a Berean, yes. Uh, the other bit of business is that we're more than happy to hear from you. If you have any comments, suggestions, or you know, want to chat with us about what you're hearing here on the on the Bible talk studies. And we thank those who have yes. contacted us. We do appreciate that. So you can contact us by email at office at BibleTalk.com, or you can contact us on our Facebook page, which is Facebook slash In Search of Christianity. Period. <laughs> yes. All right. So as I said, we're continuing on in this look at the at the prayer, and we're going to look at this. Uh, if I can find my little copy of my notes, and which is, give us this day our daily bread. Right at the top. Right at the top, where it belongs at the moment. I promise you. All right. Give us this day our daily bread. I said when we're praying, one of the principal things in prayer is to be listening to God. Yes. It's not us talking to God, it is talking with God. Mm -hmm. So if we pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread, mm -hmm. are we praying an unnecessary prayer? I wouldn't think so. <laughs> Alice wouldn't think so. And that's good thinking because you want to know something? This is what Jesus said. Here's how you should pray. Exactly. This is the model, right? Exactly. But the reason I ask that is I want you to stop and think, because God watches over his word to perform it, and God spoke through the Apostle Paul to say, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Amen. in Philippians 4.19. Mm -hmm. Food, that's, that's not a want, that's not a desire, that's a need that we have in our lives, right? Yes. And God has promised to meet that need. So, why are we praying to ask him to give us that, if he's already promised to do that? Mm -hmm. Because you've heard me say here a lot of times, we need, to be, we need to be careful and prayerful about the fact, we don't always need to be asking God to do something that he's already done. Yeah. Right. All right? So, what's the deal here? Well, we need new bread every day. Well, uh, remember the manna in yeah. the wilderness. Yes, you need it every day. One of the things we need to remember is... Well, you're not going to say, you know what, here's where I'm going to start. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 4. And I'm sure you'll 
you recognize this as we talk about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. In Matthew 4, starting at verse 2, he said, And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. All right? There's something here for us to learn. I mean, you know, we need to set our minds on the things above. We need to be thinking and appraising things spiritually. The bread that we need, Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days. Mm -hmm. And you want to know something? He wasn't, he wasn't hungry for those 40 days. It was at the end of the 40 days that he became hungry. And in that natural, that physical need that he had at that point, because after 40 days you need food, right? right. That, that Satan, that serpent, struck and tried to play on what he perceived as the weakness yes. of Jesus, right. yeah. the need for food. He said, well, if you're God, if you're the Son of God, turn us rocks into bread. But Jesus said, no. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is something else that sustains us. There is something else that nourishes us. Mm -hmm. And you want to know? We need that every day. day. Yes. We need that every day. A spiritual word. Because God has promised. And, and, you know, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and, I, and I, I keep saying this, you know, we're doing this, well, I don't know how many weeks we've been in the Sermon on the Mount already. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take weeks for Jesus to, first time, to share this teaching yeah. on, on that Mount, all right? So let's not get too disconnected, because you do remember that in the Beatitudes, one of the, one of the first things that Jesus said in the sermon is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst. Well, Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. The bread of life come down from heaven, right? Yes. That satisfies us. The prayer, this daily prayer, helps us to understand and focus on our glorious dependence on the one who is our provider. Amen. So you may, you may start to think, well, I have food to eat because of the job I do, because I get a salary at the end of the week. No, you have food to eat because of the graciousness of God, who supplies all good things to us. We, we tend to think that we're taking care of things with our own hands. But we're taking care of things with our trust in the faithfulness of God, our Savior, right? Because we cannot do anything without Him. Without him. Oh, it's true. Remember how, again, let me go back to where this started. The first one of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything that we can call our own. We have, and if you, if you miss that, go back because all of these programs are there on the Bible Talk website. We don't have anything that we can call our own possession. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns it all. He has entrusted us, He has given us stewardship mm -hmm. over the work of His hands. But it belongs to Him. If you have bread, it's because He provided. He's supplied. You know, the, they're the, the Hebrew, the Jewish people, they pray a prayer of grace over their food. Mm -hmm. And I'm just giving you a little rough translation here. It's, it's Baruch Atara Noel. Blessed are thou, Lord God, King of all creation. It's through your goodness that we have this bread. Mm -hmm. All right? It's through God's goodness that we have this. Yes. We need to see him as the author, the supplier of all good things in our life. All right. So that poorness causes us to appraise things spiritually and trust that regardless of what's going on in our life, regardless of the circumstance, He will indeed meet every need that we have, supply all of our needs. And the most basic one is the food that we need. You know, I was just thinking about it. When every day they give us this day our daily bread every day, but the word that we need every day is different. The, the word that we may need for today that he wants to give us, because he knows what's going on in that day. And then the next day, there's a word that we need. 
That's what I was just saying. So you're saying that sometimes it's white bread, sometimes it's rye bread. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, I, I get it. Well, it's a living word. Yes, right? it is. And that living word is, by the way, Jesus Christ, who is made flesh and dwelt among Amen. us. Amen. But this is how we come to set our minds on the things above and not on the things that are on earth. Right? And the spiritual man is, to, is called to appraise all things, all things spiritually. See, natural people, they don't understand this. They'll, they'll never get it. It says the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God right. because they are spiritually praised, appraised. Spiritual appraisal is required to understand the work of God, it's the things of God. Right? Manna, manna from heaven. Mm -hmm. right? Think about this in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy 10, 12, I'm going to read from. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's what Jesus was quoting from. You know, in John chapter 12, it says that Jesus didn't say anything that he hadn't heard from the Father. He heard it from this word. And when you read these words... You need to understand that you are hearing from the living God. Mm, that's right. You need to understand that you're hearing from Him. And these words are the words of life. These are the words that can build faith, will build faith in your life. Faith that pleases God. Faith that gives you the power to be living in the fullness of life, abundant life that Christ came for you to have. God is not in poverty, nor does He want you in poverty. Now, I'm not talking about the world and the things of the world. I am talking about the spiritual riches of God. He'll supply all of your needs through his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, right? Amen. And he's made promises. It says in Psalm 34, David knew this. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. God wants to bless you. He has promised to supply. He has promised to give you what you need. Our bread. When we focus on our relationship with the Father, we begin to confess His superiority, His holiness, His kingdom, His will, His provision. Our needs are basic. Our needs are basic. It says, if you have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Right? Daily bread is our need. Not fancy homes and cars, not wealth. We don't need to be focused on material things because we have the assurance of His love for us. We have the assurance of His faithfulness to provide our needs. We only need to focus on the loving Father who supplies those daily needs. We don't need to persuade Him to give them to yeah. us. So when we're praying, give us this day our daily bread, it should be bringing us to a place where we're understanding that God is the supplier of everything we need. And you want to know something? Let's get real about this. I'll tell you what you need. And this is what caused so much offense in the early church with the people of the Jews. Go read it in John chapter 6. You can talk about bread. Everybody understands the need for food. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. Otherwise, you will not be nourished. You'll not grow. You'll waste away. You'll waste away spiritually. And by the way, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. You know, it says God has set eternity upon our hearts. Mm -hmm. Everybody out there, saved and unsaved, righteous and unrighteous, saint and sinner, knows somewhere down deep inside there's supposed to be more than this life, these 70 years or so that we have on this planet. I, I was thinking today, and I don't know why, when I was praying early this morning, I was just thinking about, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm over 70 now. That's the sell-by date, right? That's what, that's what we're Sorry. getting. I'm past my sell-by sell date. date. Okay. The simple fact of the matter is, I have an absolute confidence that I will not die one day before my appointed time. That's right. Go read Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. And I am convinced that I will live to the fullest up until, up until that time that I am called to be with Him. 
I won't go too soon, and I won't go too late. God is in control and in charge. That doesn't give me a comfort about dying, because you want to know something? I had that all right already. I believe what Paul said, and I want to be like Paul when he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. This is a better place, a better life, a better place that we're going to. So, you know, there's nothing to fear here. But you have to nourish your spirit. If you don't, you will start to wither away. We serve a God of miracles. He can do whatever it takes. I, I just want to share this little story. We were in West Africa a few years ago, a number of years ago. And I had decided when we went over there, and I, I just say, I went over, I decided we were there for a month, mm -hmm. and I decided to fast for that month while we were there. And he said, fast for a month? Oh, I get hungry. You know, you want to know something? I never got hungry. And we'd go to these, I was, we were traveling all over the, uh, all over the country of Cameroon, from city to city, village to village, teaching and preaching. And in that African culture, like many cultures outside of the West here, food and a meal shared together is very, very important. Mm -hmm. So we would go places and we'd sit and we'd have meals with people. And I would sit at that table and I had, I had to try and gracefully bow away and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not eating. I didn't want to make a big, I didn't want to make a deal out of it. You know, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily want people to know that I'm fasting, but by the same token, I, I, I don't want to seem like I'm being rude. Mm -hmm. So that, everybody was fine with that. However, We'd sit at a big table, and I was passing food from one end of the table to the other. Mm -hmm. I'd pass the food, and as it went under my nose, I would spit it. Mm. Take a whiff. <laughs> now you might think, well, that will tempt you. No, you know what it did? It satisfied. filled me. It satisfied me. I would take a whiff of the food going by, and it was like I just ate it. Mm. It was such a miracle. I mean, we were there for a month. I never, never once had the slightest pang of hunger during that period of time. God was doing something miraculous just to bless me. Because you want to know something? He loves to bless me. Mm -hmm. And He loves to bless, to bless you. Mm -hmm. If you would just let Him. All right. So it is good for us to go back every day and recognize and confess our, our knowledge of the fact that we are dependent on Him and His work in our lives. That we get away from the fact that, no, no, you know what? I supply my food. I supply my daily bread. I go out and I work hard and I say, no, you don't. You don't go out into the workplace to supply your bread. You go out into the workplace to be an ambassador for Christ, bringing the knowledge of his presence into every place that you go. You work for him. That's your job. That's, That's your true. job. Mm -hmm. If Christians would only understand this, they would never fear being fired. Because you can't be fired if you're working for the Lord. You're going to let me transfer it from here to there. He's got it covered. Start to walk in that confidence of God's love for you. All right. Maybe I've been a little hesitant to get into this one because this is one you really need. We're going to go into the next part of this prayer. And I've, I have said so many this times. This is major. Yeah. This is probably one of the... Now, Jesus instructed us to pray this way. And this may be the most dangerous words that come out of your mouth. These words that he taught may be the most dangerous there are. And forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you really want to pray that? Well, God forgives. Yes, he does. His love is unconditional. Salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But these are the words of Jesus Christ that you better pay attention to. If you don't forgive somebody over there, God will not forgive you. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be in agreement with that. I want the words to come out of your mouth and say, Father, forgive us as we forgive others. Would I be wrong to paraphrase it this way? Don't forgive me any better than I forgive that other person? Is that not dangerous? It is if you're not operating in the love of God. Think about the love of God. In Psalm 86, verse 5, it says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness 
to all who call upon you. And Jesus on the cross, in the most horrific circumstances that you can even conceive of, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then Stephen, here's the example. You can say, well, that was Jesus. Well, you know what? That was also Stephen, yeah. a man who the church had called just to be a, a waiter on tables. Mm -hmm. But God had a better plan. If you're willing to serve, I promise you God has a better plan. It says in Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60, when Stephen was being stoned to death, for proclaiming the truth. It says they went on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. What a powerful prayer. What a powerful, you know how powerful that prayer was? Well, because that is the proclamation of the love of God. That is the the invitation of Jesus on the cross. There was a, another young man who was there who was in so much agreement to the stoning, the execution of Stephen, that he was holding people's coats so they could throw the stones ever harder. His name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And he heard Stephen pray this prayer. Yes, and I promise you, that was a seed that was planted that bore fruit on a road to Damascus years later when Paul encountered the living, the risen, risen Savior, yes. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. See, we don't have to beg God for forgiveness. We only need to repent and the sin is gone and repent, remember no more. Mm -hmm. You know, so remember as far as the east is to the west. As far, when your sin is cast away, it's cast away as far as the east is from the west. And remember, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. It's not like you're the, the old thing just kind of cleaned up a little bit. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You've been born again. You have a fresh start. Fresh start. So I hear so many people that say, well, yeah, I forgave that person. I, I, I can't forget that. Well, I want you to listen to that's. I want you to listen to the voice of God because it reveals the heart of God. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 43. And if you've not read this chapter in a while, go back and read the whole chapter. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. And then in verse 25, he says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 43, 25. God not only forgives, he forgets. He doesn't call to mind. You know who does? Satan. He is the accuser of the brethren. If, if somebody brings back to your mind sins that you have indeed repented of, I'll tell you who it is. It's that old devil. The accuser. The accuser of the brethren. You, ne you need not listen to his voice, okay? So when we pray this, this is to remind us, to make us conscious of, to make us think about, to meditate on the fact of how much we have been give, forgiven. Mm -hmm. we, let's go back in the things we read. You say, well, have you never heard this? Have you ever never shared the gospel with somebody? You go, well, I'm not a sinner. I never killed anybody. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, well, if you were angry with somebody. He said, well, I never, I never cheated on my wife. I never committed adultery. But Jesus said, well, if you looked on another woman with lust. The heart is deceitful above all else. And I want you to know there is a blackness in the heart of man that came from the death of Adam and has been transmitted from generation to generation, from generation to generation. And we are born with that stain of sin. Yes. Which is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born of your heavenly Father who has no sin to pass along. You're clean. That stain is washed away. Washed away. Hallelujah. He won't remember your sins. So let me ask you a question. How can you dare, how dare you say you forgave somebody, but you're unwilling to forget what they've done? Or you say, well, you don't understand. That's hard. I know how hard it is. You think I've not had to experience this? Of course, we all have. We all have Every to. single one of us. 
But I've learned the secret. I've learned the key to being able to forget the transgression. When you, when somebody has sinned against you, and you choose, and it is a choice, to forgive them, the only way you will ever be, come to that place where that will never come to your mind anymore when you see them is to diligently start praying for them. Amen. Do good for them. Isn't this what Paul says in Romans chapter 12? Isn't it? He says, you know, if your enemy, if your enemy does you evil, you, you're right. supposed to do him right. good. Right. You're supposed to return good for evil. Right. So what good do you have? You have no greater good than to pray the blessings of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God upon that person's life. And your heart will change. And it will change you. It will. It will change you. And you can think to yourself, perhaps, that it doesn't matter a lot because, well, you know, I still, there's still a brother, there's still a sister, I still... I just don't have to fellowship with them. You don't have to fellowship. I want to, I want to tell you something. This unity, and we're going to talk about this in our next program, this unity is one of the greatest schemes, wiles yes. of the devil. Yes. He does it to bring destruction on the church and people in the church. Yes, it does. It says in my Bible, so it's going to say in yours too, unless you have some wacko translation. <laughs> Behold how blessed and becoming it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. How pleasant it is for brothers. To... If you come upon a brother who you've forgiven, but don't forget what they've done to you. It will never be pleasant for you to see them. Right. And if it's not pleasant for you to come into their presence, you know what? It's a sign you that you are in forgiven. disunity. Right. No, it's oh. a sign you don't have unity. Because yeah. unity it's is pleasant. pleasant. Yeah. So if there are brothers and sisters in the Lord that you've had conflict with, and, and you know, you've forgiven them, they've forgiven you, whatever it is, and it's not pleasant for you to be around them, you need to be praying. Not necessarily for them. Let a man examine himself. You need to be praying for you. That your heart would be cleansed from that. Yes. God is the font of all good things. He will give you a peace. He will give you that love. For the love of God has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. You need to exercise that love. You need to practice that love. You need to come to the place where you can pray, Father, Forgive me the same way I forgave him. Yes. Teach me how to forgive. Oh, wait a minute. He did that. Yes. He did that 2,000 years ago, hanging upon a cross outside of Jerusalem, beaten, whipped, mocked, nailed to a cross when he said, Father, forgive them. I promise you, and if you accepted that great gift of God, he has never once since reminded you of a sin that he had forgiven. It's gone. Oh, what a great love. Oh, what a great love. Please, don't pray this prayer without thinking about this prayer. Don't pray about your daily bread without realizing that he gives it and provides it. Don't pray that we forgive like unless you're prepared to do that. But the love of God has been poured into your heart, and Father, we thank you for that. The Lord, you never call us to do anything that you don't equip us to do. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit, the truth, the spirit of truth that indwells us, Lord God, that empowers us, empowers us to love beyond and give forgiveness as we have been forgiven. Help us, Lord, to understand that you are the supplier of all we need. Amen. Mess. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Let God use you for the glory of His name. So I cherish.